Hey everyone, and welcome back to the channel. We're now on our third Econometrics 101 lesson. If you haven't had the opportunity to watch the previous ones yet, we'll link them in the description as we strongly recommend that you watch the series in chronological order to get the most out of it. This week we're hopping into lesson 2.2 and we'll be covering things such as expected value, mean, variance, standard deviation, as well as a very short introduction to the concepts of skewness and kurtosis. With that said, let's get into it. Alright everyone, welcome back to the Econometrics 101 series. This week we're covering lesson 2.2, primarily focusing on how to calculate expected values, mean and variance with some other key concepts sprinkled in as well. To start us off, we're going to be looking at the topic of expected value. Now expected value of a random variable, let's call it y, can be denoted e of y, and it's the long run average value of a random variable over many repeated trials or occurrences. Now the expected value of y is also commonly referred to as the expectation of y or the mean of y, denoted mu of y. Now this funny looking m is lowercase mu. For those of you who don't know, mu is the 12th letter of the Greek alphabet and in econometrics it will often represent the mean or the average of a set of random variables. So now that we know what mu of y or the expectation of y is, we should learn how to calculate it. Here's the equation for calculating the expectation of y. Now in this formula, e of y is the expectation of y or the mean of y. Now assuming that there are k possible outcomes, lowercase y1 to yk are all of the possible outcomes. y1 is the first possible outcome, y2 is the second possible outcome, y3 is the third possible outcome, and so on and so forth until you get to the final outcome, which is outcome k. Again, assuming that there are k possible outcomes, then lowercase p1 to pk are the associated probabilities to the y1 through yk outcomes. Finally, we have this very confusing looking function. For those of you who are unfamiliar, this is a summation function showing the exact same addition as the long form or expanded equation, it's just more condensed. You would read it as the sum of all lowercase y's, which are the different outcomes, times their associated probabilities for all values of i, which run from 1, the first outcome, to k, which is the final outcome. Now the best way to learn something like this is by actually doing it, so now we're going to take a look at a numerical example. Does this data look familiar? Well it should, as this is one of our examples from our previous video, Lesson 2.1. For those of you who need a refresher, this table shows the probability distribution that your computer will crash during a Zoom call. The possible outcomes are 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5 crashes. We assumed that after five crashes, you'll just rage quit on the call altogether, which means that there's only these possible values for outcomes. Your computer can't crash less than zero times, it can't crash 3.7 times, and it can't crash a sixth time. The second row shows each of the associated probabilities for the six different outcomes. So with this information, we can simply plug the values into our new equation and calculate the expectation of y, also known as mu y. So recall our equation, now we're simply going to fill in the values. Here I have the expectation of C, which stands for my random variable, which is the number of crashes. But if you want to stick with the letter Y, that's totally fine as well. Here I've written out that the expectation of C is equal to outcome C sub zero, that is zero crashes, times P sub zero, which is the respective probability of zero crashes, plus C sub one, the outcome of one crash, times p sub 1, the associated probability of one crash, and so on and so forth for all six possible outcomes of 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5 crashes. Well, from the table we just looked at, let me sub in these values for c0 and p0 through c5 and p5, and simplify the equation. So this is just those values plugged in, and with a little bit of simple algebra, voila, now we know that the expected value of c is 0.48. But how do you interpret that value? What does it actually mean? We already said that the number of crashes must be an integer, so how can you have 0.48 crashes? Well, it essentially means that if you were to perform a very high number of trials, the average number of crashes in all of those trials would be 0.48 crashes. That's how you would interpret this 0.48 value. Now, before we dive into variance and standard deviation, we'll very quickly cover the special case of the Bernoulli random variable, since I know that you're all wondering about it. The expected value of a Bernoulli variable follows the same formula as before, however, since there's only two outcomes, it's significantly easier. 
So we have the outcome that the random variable is one times the probability P plus the outcome that the random variable is zero times the associated probability one minus P. This simplifies to P, which implies that the expected value of a Bernoulli random variable is just P. See, told you it was that easy. Now we're going to look at two important factors of a probability distribution, and those are variance and standard deviation. Variance and standard deviation measure the spread or dispersion of a probability distribution. The variance of a random variable is denoted as theta squared of y, or simply variance of y, is equal to the expected value of the square of the deviation from y from its mean. Sounds super confusing, right? Well, let's break it down. Not all outcomes will be exactly equal to the mean or average. Some will be higher than the average and some will be lower. How far an outcome is from the average is called the spread, and that's what variance and standard deviation are a measure of. Looking at this formula, we see that we're taking the difference between the actual outcome, uppercase y, and the mean, which is mu y, and then we square that difference. So where does the e come from? Well, we must take the value from each of the outcomes one through k, just as we did for the mean. So we could also write this as a summation, and it would look something like this. Again, this just means that we're summing up the difference of each actual outcome from the mean, all squared for every possible outcome. However, what's the unit for variance? We know that the unit for the mean or average is in terms of whatever the y variable is measured in. In our previous example, we used c instead of y, and mu of c was equal to 0.48 computer crashes. So the number of crashes was the unit. Well, the unit for variance would be computer crashes squared. Now that's difficult to interpret, so instead we would take the square root of the variance to get the standard deviation. And the standard deviation is in the same units as the mean, and therefore much easier to understand and interpret. So again, to get the standard deviation, you just take the square root of the variance, and if the variance is denoted as theta squared of y, well then the standard deviation is simply denoted as theta of y. As I was saying before, I truly believe that the best way to learn something like this is by actually doing it. So now we're going to take a look at a numerical example using the exact same data as before. Follow along carefully as I want this to make sense the first time, but it's no problem if it doesn't. Feel free to rewind and follow along closely while taking some notes to really understand this formula and how to properly sub in these values. So recall the original equation for variance. So here you'll notice that I've expanded our summation using the letter C for crashes rather than Y, but as I said before, you can use any letter, it really doesn't matter. Now I'm going to plug in each individual value that I know from the data displayed earlier in the video and from lesson 2.1. So here I have that the variance of C is equal to the first outcome, which is zero crashes, minus mu C, which is the mean we calculated earlier to be 0.48. All of that squared times the probability of zero crashes, which is 0.78. We add that to the next outcome, which is one, minus the mean, which is the same as before, 0.48, all squared times the probability of one crash, which is 0.08. We add that to the following outcome, which is two crashes, minus the mean, which is, you guessed it, 0.48, all squared times the probability of two crashes, which is 0.06. And I will do this for the final three outcomes as well. So three crashes, four crashes, and five crashes. Now with some simple algebra, I've determined the probability weighted variance is 1.109611. Remember that we said variance presents an awkward unit of measurement. So we'll take the square root of that to get the standard deviation, which in this example is approximately 1.05 crashes. Now standard deviation being good or bad all depends on the data you're analyzing. Remember, it's simply a measure of the outcome spread from the mean. So in other words, there's not really a threshold that must be met for standard deviation to be deemed good or bad. Moving ahead, we're going to briefly look at two more measures which look at the shape of the distribution, and that's skewness and kurtosis. Put simply, skewness measures the lack of symmetry of a distribution. Sometimes a distribution may be skewed more to the left or right of the mean, rather than equally distributed on both sides. Kurtosis, on the other hand, measures how thick the tails of the distribution are. If there are a lot of outliers, that is, outcomes that deviate a great deal from the mean, then the tails of the distribution will be thicker as more outcomes are appearing further away from the mean. Now, these two topics alone have a lot of information involved with them, so if you're struggling to understand the concepts and would like a dedicated video to either or both of them, just let us know in the description. The algebraic formula for skewness is here. Remember that the Greek letter mu is the mean and the Greek letter theta is the standard deviation. So to calculate skewness, those are the key values that you will need. 
Since this is a measure of symmetry of a distribution, it's worth noting that a negative value represents a distribution that is skewed to the left of the mean. A positive value represents a distribution that is skewed to the right of the mean. A skewness of zero would imply a distribution that is perfectly symmetrical around the mean. The algebraic formula for kurtosis is here. Since it's raised to the power of four, it's actually impossible to have a negative value. But it's worth noting that for kurtosis, a value greater than three is called leptokurtic which means that the distribution has many data points in its tails and it's deemed heavy tail. Neither skewness nor kurtosis have units, so changing the units of Y will not change either of these parameters. Yes, I know that's a lot of information for a single lesson, and for those of you who are still watching, thank you for your attention, and I truly hope that you found this video helpful. In lesson 2.3, we'll be covering some brand new concepts using two random variables, such as joint and marginal distributions, conditional distributions, the law of iterated expectations, and the independence of variables. If you aren't familiar with these terms yet, don't worry, you will be by the end of the next lesson. If you like this video, found it helpful, and are excited to see more, let us know by liking the video, subscribing to the channel, and leave us a comment in the comment section below. This concludes lesson 2.2. Thanks for watching this video, and we'll catch you in the next.